Welcome to Joy. So glad you're with us today. If you have not turned in your Faith Promise card, uh, you can still do that. I encourage you to do that. <clears throat> we are uh, encouraged. Last year we had a Faith Promise of around 69,000 and about 70 uh, plus thousand came in. And this year our Faith Promise is at 79,000. So we praise the Lord for that. And uh, we rejoice in that, celebrate that uh, you uh, have not only followed through down through the years with fulfilling your promises, but also that we're, we're going to be able to cover those expenses, uh, hopefully without any problems this year, uh, of the um, monthly support at least, that so we celebrate that. Also an update on the press, uh, we have purchased it, if you didn't hear that, <coughs> Uh, we were trying to get it installed the second week of April. The riggers can't do that. Um, so we can't do it in May like they wanted to because that's when we're printing the Baptist spread. But they're going we're trying to get it scheduled for the second week of June. Uh, be in prayer there. We're still short about 30,000, but a, you know, just a few weeks ago we were asking for 65. So uh, we praise the Lord that it's coming down well. We do need that money. We need the plate maker and the, uh, the other things that we're going to need to get up and running with this new press. So I encourage you to continue to pray about that. Uh, I want to thank all of those churches who uh, received the Baptist bread, who helped us with this too in a, in a big way. Plus, some of our own folks have put in uh, generously. We thank the Lord for that. We are in the study of the book of Revelation, and uh, you know a lot of a lot of revelation makes it a little difficult to have like these up warm and fuzzy lovey lovey kind of messages okay <laughs> and we're in one of those passages right now in revelation in chapter seventeen and eighteen, uh, which I've entitled Babylon Fallen again here we are not working chronologically, we're working through the, the chronologically through the chapters, but God didn't lay out Revelation chronologically. So we are going back with some details of specific judgment, specifically that of Babylon. Um, and Babylon in Scripture represents the worldly, devilish systems that are both political and economic it's the powers of it. It is all of the false religions uh, of the world. <clears throat> and as, the, as part of the end times, the very end of the tribulation period, God will judge and destroy both the religious system, Babylon, and the political and economic system of Babylon. Now, there's a couple of things. First of all, I think we need to understand that the way this is laid out, the things that are going on, uh, political and economic Babylon have always existed since the fall, especially since the Tower of Babel. But this is the end times where it is all-powerful across the world. Much of this, because we are so close to the rapture of, of the saints and the tribulation period, much of this could and likely is in process even now. Right? The tribulation period only lasts seven years. So those who will come to power, you know, no man knows the day or the hour, but it is very possible those people are gaining recognition and gaining position right now okay, to be in that place when the rapture occurs and the takeover begins. In chapter 17, verses 1 and 2, it says, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her 
fornication. We'll look into that. Heavenly Father, as we open up your word today, Lord, we are all affected by the world system, this system driven by the devil and the greed and the sin of man. Lord, we are witnessing so much of this as humankind has down through the generations. Lord, we pray that our hearts and minds would be opened by your Holy Spirit. For those who don't know you as Savior, Lord, they would come to see their soul's deep need. For each of us who are, Lord, that we would be enlightened, we would have our understanding opened by knowing you and by knowing your plan, that we might recognize these things and we might stay true to you and not the world. Lord, help us to be effective as we minister for you, as we move through this world as the light of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen. <clears throat> Chapter 17 deals with the religious part of Babylon, the whorish religion, as God has named it, okay? It is unfaithful and it is for profit. And we see a lot of that religion today around the world. We need to understand when it says the, the whore, the great whore, it's from a word that is like porne. It means harlot, prostitution, things like that. And we get our word pornography from it. So you can understand the implications. It's not really implications, it's explanations. But using this word, Adultery, that sexual relations against marriage vows, uh, and fornication, sexual relations without the sanctity of marriage, both of which God despises, right? Both come from this word, porne. It's used in Scripture, though, when we're talking about religion to explain or to point at anything that replaces God in your beliefs and in your worship. Okay, and how might we understand that? Well, adultery would be like, you know the Lord Jesus Christ, okay, and you're involved in Christian worship, in biblical Christian worship, and you invite in the false religion. If you've seen <coughs> many who call themselves Christian churches, and you see them especially, it used to be only in the third world, now it's here too. But what they will do is they will take the religions, the false religions of their location, and they will intermingle them with Christianity, and they come up with this adulterous religion. They name the name of Jesus, but they also worship the devils and use the demonic practices and those things. And you would be amazed at how many churches, both outside the United States and inside the United States, have done this, assimilating the false religions and saying, okay, let's name the name of Jesus, but let's also do these things. Fornication would be those who hear the truth but aren't believers, okay? And instead of worshiping the one true God, they're worshiping something else, anything else. Because any religion, any worship that does not worship Jesus Christ and God the Father through Jesus Christ is false religion and is part of false Babylon religion. Because if you are not worshiping Jesus Christ, you are Maybe in a roundabout way, but you are worshiping the devil. Idolatry of any kind, the Bible says, is as witchcraft. Satan worship. You can call it whatever you want, but if you're not going through Jesus, what's the Bible say? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But people say, well, we need, all the, we need to reach all the people. I agree with that part. But we do it by assimilating what they already believe, and then we teach Jesus on the side. Now, it can't be that way. It cannot be that way. The scripture talks about bitter water and sweet water from the same well. It doesn't work. 
the description of this false Babylonian religion shows her, the way the Bible describes it, riding on the power of the beast, the Antichrist, the scarlet-colored beast with uh, seven heads and ten horns and all of these things that are described in Scripture. And it says that she is decked out with all of the riches and trappings of power. That's what we're looking at. This religion is going to be impressive. It will impress people on many levels. And then it will turn everyone toward the, the, um, the Antichrist as God. It says she is full of the names of blasphemy, evil speaking, railing against all kinds of things, but especially against the one true God. And it says that she is named Mystery Babylon, the great mother of harlots and abominations. What's this saying? It's saying that even though Satan, the prince of the power of the air, the, the leader of all the false religions, whether you want to believe it or not, you know, there's so many false religions around. There are some under the na name of Christian and under the name of Christ, but there are also worldwide religions, all of which worship different gods, bring up different people to pray to and pray through and all of those things. <clears throat> you know, we have, uh, in the Middle East, we have those, you have to do the, the pillars of Islam, you have to do a lot of those things, it's a lot of works, you have to bow down so many times a day, and, uh, and all of these things, and they elevate Allah and Muhammad to these heights. In the, in the uh, Near East, there are a myriad of gods. You can worship a hundred gods if you want at the same time. And, it, you know, the truth is Satan doesn't care who you worship as long as it's not Jesus. Because anyone else you worship is actually leading you to the devil, to Satan himself, Lucifer. You go to the Far East, you know, and you find things that either they worship everything or they're worshiping nothingness. You know, one of the most dangerous religions is right here in the United States. It's called humanism. People say that is not a religion. It absolutely is a religion. It teaches you that you're your own God. And you're not God. Hate to break it to you, but you're not God. That is a false religion. And the devil doesn't care. Because once he enslaves you, you will begin to worship him. If you are not, it, the Bible teaches, Jesus himself taught, that if you don't choose him and become a child of God, you are already a child of the devil, religiously speaking. Right? So do nothing. You're on the broad way to destruct, destruction. You are already worshiping the devil, whether you know it or not, and you will not see heaven. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. It says that she, this religion, is drunken with the blood of the saints throughout the ages. You see, Babylon is not new. It's not new. This, saint, this religion is followed by the unbelieving, those whose names are not in the book of life. Now, there's a part of me, I believe I understand some of how this works, the book of life and the Lamb's book of life, and that I don't know all the nuances because everyone that's living seems to be in the book of life, but you can only be in the Lamb's book of life if you are trusting in Jesus Christ. And when you accept the Lord Jesus Christ, it says your name is indelibly put in there with the blood of Jesus. It cannot be erased. It will not be removed for any reason. we find it difficult sometimes to understand how people can believe the things they believe unless you read and study the Scripture. When you read the Scripture, when you study the Scripture, you can find that without Christ, there is inherent blindness, a lack of understanding. There is no wisdom because you don't know God. There is no understanding because you do not know God. You look at the devil, okay? 
fallen, most powerful angel God ever created. Beautiful. Enticing in every way. <clears throat> and he controls these false religions. What is one of his greatest powers, duties, whatever you want to call it? Blinding the minds of the unbelieving. That's Bible. Now when you see that if they're not trusting in Christ and they are blinded by the devil and that he is putting in their hearts and minds all of these falsehoods, now we can begin to look at these people not as, and, and not hate them. Even though they're absolutely wrong and destroying families and destroying nations and destroying you know, minds, we can now understand that they're blinded. Okay? We don't want to agree with what they have to say. We do not want to empower them in any way, but we do need to understand so that we look at them as people in need of Jesus Christ and don't look at them as enemies. That's important when you're trying to fulfill the will of God in your life. These, this false religion is supported by a unified religion against Christ. Now, this is bigger than what we have today. Because today, the false religions fight each other, right? Right? It's, it's just the way it's been. And when you start mixing the religions, when you start mixing, we already talked about that, there are great problems. But this, in this day, this religion will be worldwide. That doesn't mean everyone in the world will believe it, but it will be worldwide and it will be powerful. It talks about the seven hills, the seven kings leading to one beast who is uh, empowering ten kings, and at that time, you know, he's not in power yet, but from every nation and people on earth. Now, every person is a sinner by nature. We are born sinners. And so it's very easy for the devil to impress upon them these false teachings, these false religions. Um, there are many descriptions about some of these things, these seven kings, uh, the nations, the kingdoms. Uh, if you study in Daniel, there's the implication of these different uh, powers that ruled, <coughs> excuse me, Rome and Greece and Medo-Persia and you know, right on down through, and then the renewed, what has always been called the renewed uh, Roman kingdom, but what we see, if you put all of this together, is a huge study on what has happened down through history and how the Antichrist comes to power. We're not going to spend a bunch of time on that. It is complicated, okay? But it talks about the seven hills and the seven kings. You know, what are the seven hills? I remember being taught that the seven hills were the seven hills around Rome, because the Catholic Church was going to be the center of the um, worship of the Antichrist. Others have said it's Mecca, the seven hills surrounding Mecca, say that it's going to be Mecca, and it'll be at the, the heart of the Islamic world. Um, some say that the seven, it's seven major religions, and others say it's the seven mountains of dominionism, uh, which these areas that shape culture and shape, <coughs> excuse me, and influence society, that being religion, family, education, government, media, uh, arts and entertainment, and business. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says his kingdom, his power, his throne will be set up in Jerusalem. I believe it's going to be an admixture of all of those religions put together because the false prophet is going to convince the leaders of those religions to say, stop worshiping who you're worshiping, and this Antichrist who, man, he suffered a lethal blow, and he rose again from the dead. He's the one we need to worship as God. 
And they, the false prophet brings all that worship to him. So it, I don't believe it's going to be any one thing. I believe it's going to be all these things from across the world, all the false religions put together, because that's where his power comes from uh, religiously, okay? But all of these, no matter what we're talking about, all the false religions, all of the, the major influences of society, all the things that empower this false religion have one thing in common. They are united against the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We see it in our society today. You can have in a school a Satan club, but most of them won't let you have a Jesus club. You can have any kind of club you want. You can teach anything you want. Just don't teach Jesus. And our laws are changing. Everything is changing to say, if the Bible wants it, be against it. No, they're unified. And we're seeing that happen today. Okay? Now, some of the religions don't do that. Some of the religions set even more stringent rules on people and the way they dress, the way they do things. But in general, they're against Jesus Christ. And it says God will turn their own heart, okay, against religious Babylon. At first, they're going to be supporting the beast directly. But this religion is going to lose power of its own, and it'll all be given to the beast, the Antichrist. It'll elevate the beast, the Antichrist, to the status of God in the eyes of all the people. Isn't that what Satan always wanted? The I wills of Satan from Ezekiel. That God is going to actually their own religious belief system will destroy themselves as they point everyone toward the Antichrist, toward the devil. When you get to chapter 18, you get to economic or political Babylon. In verse 2 it says, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. This economic, political Babylon is the same one that's been working down through the years. It is the, it is the policies, it's the way of Satan <clears throat> in dealing with all of these things. He is twisting it all, and it's following Satan's agenda. They, most people do not realize that. I mean, that are out there in the world that don't know the Scripture. But it says God's going to return her abuses on herself, on this political system, this uh, economic system, I'm going to turn it back on itself double. All the abuses they've ever committed against others, those in control are going to suffer those consequences. And it says here in Revelation 18 that the judgment of economic and political Babylon, the destruction of it will come in one day. I mean, that's the wrath of God. Remember the, the judgment that said that there would be a great earthquake uh, in uh, in Jerusalem, and the city be divided in three, and it talks about 70 of the most influential people will be killed that day. Now, what happens to the economic and political powers if you take away the 70 most powerful, manipulating people of all the things in the world? The entire system will collapse in one day. I don't know if that's what that is, but it sure makes sense to me. As economic Babylon falls, the kings will weep, but there'll be no help. You know, the mantra of business, the mantra of government around the world is massive 
profit and power justifies any abuse against people. We see it today. Anything goes for those in control. And if things aren't going the right way, they just write laws, make things happen, do whatever. You know, now, I believe we have the best governmental system that anyone's thought of to date, except when God was, the, you know, the sole ruler of Israel, okay? <clears throat> and Jesus will be in power in the millennial kingdom. But when you see this, um, even in our great government, and I believe it's the best system, you find the same abuses. If you get caught insider trading, you go to prison. But if you get in Congress, it's your right. Here, we doubled your health care costs so that we'd give health care to everyone, but everyone doesn't have health care. But you know what? If you're in Congress, you get health care for life. Now, that's the abuses of power that sinful man will naturally be drawn to and the devil empowers. Remember, we saw that the demons, the devils that are in this time, they're going to do miracles. You know, Jesus, when he took on human flesh, it says he was made a little lower than the angels, telling us that the angels are more powerful. They live forever. They had access to God. They have seen things we can't imagine yet, and so they can do miracles. The devil, his demons, all of that, they can promise you wealth, they can promise you power, they can promise you pleasure, and they can follow through with it. The trouble is, you end up a slave to it. When we talk about servitude. We serve the living God because we are grateful and thankful and we love him because he first loved us. That is far different than being bound <coughs> and abused until you submit. It says in her was found the blood of prophets and saints. You know, there are so many things. That I want to go back just a moment. There are so many abuses to what is right in our society today and around the world forever. And you say, how can people support these things that are obviously wrong? God created man and woman. Not 40 different sexes. You know, it's just a twisted mind that says, I can't agree with that. I'm going to teach biology did this. It doesn't make sense. Sin. Now there it makes sense. Okay? But guess what? Everyone without Jesus doesn't even recognize the truth because Satan's still blinding them. Again, why is that important? Because they are not our enemy. They are enslaved by the devil. They are blinded by the devil. And it's no wonder they support the kind of things they support. You know, look at our nation. Our, our elections are so skewed toward evil. Lies are the norm on both sides. I'm not saying on just one side, both sides. Why do people fall for it? Because they're blinded to the truth. And why are they blinded? Because they're not trusting Jesus Christ. You say, but a lot of Christians do this. Well, two things. First of all, some of them call themselves Christians, don't know Jesus Christ. But the other thing is, even Christians can be deceived. Okay? So what do we do? Hate on them? Try to destroy them? No. We try to show them the hope of Jesus Christ. That's what this whole thing's about. I want to touch on this first. In her was found the blood of prophets and saints. You know, in, in 1823 and 24 it says, and the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. 
I mean, this system is going to be crushed, destroyed. We're not talking about a downturn in the economy. We're not even talking about the Great Depression. We're talking about the absolute destruction of the world economic and political system in one day. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by, the, by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. What's that say? What are sorceries? Those are the powers of the devil being used by humans. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints of all that were slain upon the earth. And you know that is true, not just of the tribulation period, but all the way back. It is false political power, false religious power, all of those things that have slain the righteous down through the generation. More often than not. Okay? Why tell us these things? I mean, by the way I see prophecy, we're not even going to be here. Not when this all takes place. Because this is tribulation. I believe the rapture comes first because we won't have to endure the wrath of God. Well, it's so that we reject Babylon even today. You see, Babylon has been around since the fall of the Tower of Babel. When man said, we can make our own way to God. All right, then God passed judgment, divided their languages and divided the people. Uh, it's interesting to see. And so we say, how did they all get so separated? And how did they get on all the continents and all of that? You know, there are, there's a passage of Scripture in Genesis 20, I think it is, that talks about the earth being divided in the days of Pharez, okay? You know, scientists tell us there used to be one supercontinent. If you divide all the people by language and all of those things that separate people, and then you divide the land, guess what's going to happen? They're going to be in different places. It doesn't have to be a land bridge through here or anything like that, or somebody got on a canoe and made it, you know, 4,000 miles. God explains it there in Genesis. The timing fits. The answers that we need are in the Bible. The problem is we're not in the Bible enough. We don't study it. We read it like a novel. But the Tower of Babel, all false religions, the wicked political and economic systems, they have been around forever. I mean, since then. And every... You know, mankind has been deceived systematically and consistently, and it's always been against the ways of God. So this is nothing new. What is different here is with the Holy Spirit <coughs> <coughs> withdrawing, because where does the Holy Spirit live? In us, believers. There are fewer of us believers as a percentage of the world than there probably ever has been, Okay? And he that led us will let. The one that was holding the reins, the Holy Spirit, is saying, let it go. Jesus Christ, God the Father, is saying, let it go. Let it come to its fruition. Let people see just what it means to follow the devil. And it's going to really ramp up and take over, and we're seeing it even today. We see it in everything. We see it in religion. We see it in politics. We see it in education. We see it in social media. We see it in the, the main media of the world. We see these propaganda machines that are pumping out anything but truth, it seems. And so you say it enough times, people believe it. You educate your youth in a certain way, you know, against God. They're gonna, that's who they're going to be. Their foundational belief system. So what is this? Why are we being told this? Because we must not fall prey to this deceit. We cannot be the light of the world if we're following Satan's ways. Now, one of the things that, that Christianity has done down through the generations, it happened with the Pharisees in, 
in uh, Israel and in Judaism, they began to look at themselves as better than everybody else. And they even added rules and laws so that they always looked better than everybody else in society. The truth is, we're all sinners, except we have had the blessing of being saved by grace. So how can we expect people that don't even know Christ to walk like Christ? And the religion of Christianity for a long time was, you're welcome in our church as long as you look like, act like, and talk like us. Well, guess what? They can't. They don't know Jesus. There are many things that God says he abhors. And there are many things in our society that we're not supposed to hate people. We're supposed to see them as bound. One of the things you'll find out, uh, well, you know, you're here, but our church, it doesn't matter where you come from, what religion you believe, it doesn't matter what anything, sexual orientation, whatever, it doesn't matter. You're welcome here. What? Yes, because you need Jesus. You're blinded. Now, I'm not going to put you in the pulpit. We're not going to put you teaching a class. Why? Because you don't know the truth. You don't even know the God we serve. But you're welcome here. And you're not here to be condemned. You're here to be shown the hope of God and the salvation that is available in Jesus Christ. Do we want to encourage your sin? No. Do we want to you know, enable you in any way? No. Jesus <clears throat> the people he got frustrated with the most was the religious leaders. Because they said, he said, how are you going to reach these people if you won't even talk to them? You'll cross the street to not come close to them. And he said, look, I mean, he's walking down the street, and he says, Zacchaeus, <laughs> and everybody knew he was an evil man because he was the tax collector. He said, come down from there. I'm going to your house to eat today. He rubbed shoulders with those who needed salvation. He just never fell prey to their beliefs, their teaching. In verse 4, it says, Another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. You want to not, you want to not be a part of the judgment of this system? Don't. Don't follow it. Now, we have to follow the laws of the land. We have to deal with the economy like it is. You know, they, people around the world have had everything taken from them before, just in currency exchanges and changes like that. I mean, it's it rampant around the world. But you see, the lie remains the same, Satan's lie. You know, he talked to Eve in the Garden of Eden and, and Adam, he says, and the serpent said unto the woman, Genesis 3, ye shall not surely die. Hath not God said this, you know, is what he said. And he said, ye shall not surely die. God said that. So he said, oh, didn't God say this? But he didn't mean that. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil, let me tell you, knowing good and evil doesn't make you God. Because of Adam and Eve eating of the garden, eating of the tree, the one tree they weren't supposed to eat of, mankind knows the difference between good and evil until it is taught out of them. Even little kids. What happens when they're doing something they know they're not supposed to? They look at you. Can I touch them? You know? Just have to. That's the sinfulness of man. But knowing that it was wrong, they knew that already. How about the temple of God? Come out from among them, he said. In 2 Corinthians 6, 12, ye are not straightened, ye are not narrowed in this, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. A lot of the things that, you're, that are restricting you from being who you ought to be and you're following after the wrong things, it's not Jesus teaching this. It is your own sinfulness. It is your own selfishness. 
Be ye also enlarged. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, light with darkness, Christ with Belial, he that believeth with an infidel, the temple of God with idols. And we see all of these things happening. You know, we saw in the Old Testament where they brought idols into the, uh, the temple. And we're going to see in, uh, in the Antichrist day, he's going to move into the temple, rebuilt to worship God, and he's going to set up his own throne there and say, I'm God, you've got to worship me. <coughs> and then he says this. He's talking to believers. For ye are the temple of the living God. Where does the Holy Spirit dwell? In the believer. So he's saying, what fellowship hath the temple of God with all the wickedness of this world and Satan's ways? It doesn't belong there. Wherefore, it says, uh, I will dwell with them and walk with them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. He says, there's this promise of wealth and power and, and pleasure and all these things, but with it comes this servitude to the devil and it comes with destruction. It doesn't lead you in the long term to good, but to destruction and hell even. But he says, wait a minute. My mandate to you is to be the light of the world. You're supposed to be out there in the world ministering. So it's not that you're supposed to stay away from the world. It's supposed to, you're supposed to stay away from the methodology of Babylon, Satan's way of doing life on this earth. So we have to, like Jesus, be willing to speak and be on good terms with the unbelieving, even the vile, but not partake in any of their wickedness. That's how our testimony shows. We need to know this because many people, <coughs> when after the rapture, remember, they're not going to have many opportunities to be saved, not going to be many witnesses to them, and maybe our witness ahead of that will be something if they've not rejected Christ, if they just haven't gotten there yet. But he says, you know, we're to be the light of the world. And, and I don't know why I had this picture, but for all of my life, the picture I see is, remember the lantern with the, the, the glass shield or, that goes over it? You know, when you're looking at it and you light that, it, and you drop that cover down, light goes everywhere. It'll light up a room. It's wonderful. But if you've got the wrong fuel, if you've got the wick turned up too high, you know, all these things, what happens to the inside of that glass? Soot gets all over it. You can wipe the outside. You can make the outside look as beautiful as you want. You can clean up for Sunday. You can even call yourself a Christian, wear a cross around your neck and do all those things. But people can't see Jesus because inside you're so polluted with the things of the world, the ways of the world, the activities in your job that you should not be involved in. But they say, hey, this is the only way we can do business. Now you have to say, no, I, I can't do that. Even if it means I can't work here, I can't do that. I have to be righteous before my God. And so what do we do? We go to God, we confess our sins, and what's he do? He cleanses us from all unrighteousness, right? And you take that shield and you clean the inside. We can clean the outside, but God has to clean the inside. And we do that in 1 John where it says confess. And then what happens? You stop looking so much at the glass and you start seeing the light. And Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Now I want you to be the light of the world. And where is Jesus? The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God is within us. What we're saying is, Lord, let me be transparent and let everybody see you. And how do we do that? 
while we're going through the same problems everybody else in the world's going through, we have joy, we have hope, we can love. We can love those that hate us even. That's what Jesus did. And now, when they're struggling and things are going bad and they're depressed and discouraged, and they, they remember the hope and the joy that you had while you were going through the same things, because Christians go through the same things everybody else does. From health problems to relation problems to mental problems to every kind of problem you can have. We need to let people know we're going through those things and yet we have the hope of God, the joy of the Lord in our lives. And that's when they're going to come and say, how is it you have such hope when I know you're going through the same things I am? And you're always ready to have the answer. Not, oh, I'm just stronger than you. No, I got Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Go ye unto all the world, but remain separate from her wickedness. How could Jesus have reached that woman at the well if he stayed on the other side of the road? How could he have healed the blind if he didn't go there? He raised the dead, but you know what? He, he raised the dead in, you know, with his presence. And there were people that came to him and said, look, my servant, my daughter, my whatever, they're so sick. And one man came and Jesus, the disciples said, well, we'll come. He said, you don't, he told Jesus, he said, I know you don't need to come. You're Jesus. Say the word. That faith. That's where we need to live. I believe the reason we're taught this in part so that people can see it in the last days and even the tribulation and the printed word and things like that, but I believe it's so that we can look beyond people's hatred, sin, difficulties, the way they look, talk, believe differently than we do and not see enemies and not see evil, but see that they are our mission field have a heart for them. Father, we come before you. We pray, Lord, that you will be glorified.